silence, we hear your voice. God, I'm reminded of the time that uh, Elijah was running. And Lord, he went up to the mountain, and Lord, there was an earthquake, and rocks exploded, and Lord, all kinds of things happened around him. But God, he didn't hear your voice until your voice came in a whisper. And Lord, as your voice spoke in a whisper, Lord, he said that the word says that he just shuddered as he heard your voice. Lord, I pray today that we would be a people who hear your voice. Lord, I pray that we would be a people today that respond to your call. Lord, I pray that we would be a people today who are in awe of you. Lord, you've said that in the end times you're going to restore the awe back to those, Lord God, who love you and worship you. They're going to worship you with awe and with wonder, Lord. And Lord, I pray may that start in this place today. Lord, I ask that you would give us eyes that see and ears that hear today what the Spirit of God is saying to the church in this hour. Lord, I thank you for this day, Lord, where a horrible snowstorm has been forecasted. Yet, God, so many of your people have come to this house today, Lord, to worship you and God, to hear a word from the throne. Lord, I pray today may we hear this word and may this word go within us like a seed. And Lord, may this seed root deeply below and bear fruit above. And Lord, may this be a word today that changes us forever. Lord, I thank you today that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will endure forever. Lord Jesus, we thank you today for the written word, the spoken word, the living word, the rhema word. Lord, may all four be active in this house today. Lord, may you release the ministry of angels in this house as this word is released. And Lord, may the, the ministry of angels go with this message as it goes through YouTube today. Lord, to anybody who's going to be listening, Lord, we ask today that this would be a word that we would never forget. Because Lord, today we don't want to just be hearers of the word. But, Lord, we want to be doers of the word also, God. So, Lord, may this word lay heavy upon us. Lord, like the Shekinah glory, the weight of God. Lord, may this word lay heavy upon us until we walk in it, Lord God. And, Lord, as we walk in it, may a new freedom come upon your people to be who you've created us to be and to walk in the individual calling that you've called each and every one of us to Lord, we understand today that we're all called to be transformed into the image of Christ Jesus. But Lord, we know beyond that there's a race for each and every one of us to run. Lord, today anoint us, excite us, equip us for that race. And Lord, may the Holy Lord start gun go off today and may we begin the sprint in the lane that you've called us to, God, understanding that the time is short and we need to work while it is still day. Lord, may this be a transforming word today. And Lord, I just right now through your blood just bind up every distraction every fear, every worry, every movement of the enemy, every word curse against this house. Lord, I just send your blood against it right now and command it to be silent and ineffective in the name of Jesus right now. Lord, we just give you this service and Lord, have your way. And Lord, I ask today as we talk about crossing over into the calling, Lord, I pray may we all cross over in our hearts today, Lord God out of a place of status quo and into the place, God, that you've called us to. Lord, may this be a prophetic message today that lights a fire that's not going to go out. So, Lord, have your way in this place. And may your word not return void, but may it accomplish its purpose. And, Jesus, we pray this in your name today, for you're the God of the narrow road. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. The lights are coming on this morning. How many are ready to receive a word from God today? Amen. Hallelujah. It 
it's interesting that uh, God's given Pastor Brent a word. And how many know this is the Lord's service? Amen. So hallelujah. If the Lord wants this word released right now, it's going to be released right now. And it's very interesting. Pastor Brent was just sharing with me that he was reading this morning uh, about the life of Elijah. And he was reading in the very passage that the Lord just had me pray about where Elijah was running from the Lord and he heard the voice of the Lord on the mountain. God was speaking that very word to Brent this morning. So how many know that's a divine correlation in the Lord? Amen. Hallelujah. So the Lord gave Pastor Brent a word. I knew God said somebody was going to get a word. Um, during just that, that brief time that we, we took to be still and know that he is God. So we're going to honor the word of God today and just receive this word. Amen. Um. So before service, I was, uh, um, I've been dealing with a lot of warfare. Um, and I, I feel like I need to read this passage because this is something that pastor just prayed. Um, there he came to a cave and and lodged in it and behold the word of the Lord came to him and said to him what are you doing here Elijah I have been very jealous for the Lord he said the God of hosts for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword and even I I alone am left and seek my life to take it away and, the, and he said go out and stand on the mount before the Lord and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people have, of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And even I, I alone left. So lots of warfare on this house that's why i got up and prayed um i just felt even in worship it just felt like there was a cap on the worship again it just felt like a struggle to get to where god wants us to be and i was just praying and asking god why i just said why is there so much warfare on this house why has there been so much warfare on this house and for those of you who've been here for a while there's an awful lot of warfare on this house like there's whatever god is doing here god is well, i don't know what god is doing here this is why. This is what he shared with me in worship. If you saw the fullness of what you are to walk in, and when he says you, he's speaking of our church. He's not spe he was not speaking just directly to me. He said, if you saw the fullness of what you are to walk in, you would be crushed by the weight of it. It's one step at a time, one day at a time, that gets you to the finished work. The warrior is at home. He's at peace in the war. On the field of battle the intercessor is at home at peace in intercession the father is at home with his family walk in what you have been called to walk in what you have been called to and then he said something to me that as the black he just gave me a picture as the blacksmith makes the sword blow by blow with the hammer then the fire then the hammer blow by blow you are being forged in fire and iron for the final days that these works would last father i just ask god that as pastor comes back up here that you give him a place to lead up wherever you're leading god but god i ask god that we would take our next step because every one of us are walking through that father or you wouldn't have given us that word you wouldn't have sh you wouldn't have shared that that passage with me beforehand and then and then give that for, for pastor to pray and father when you do things i we just want to walk in them god we just want to walk so close to you that we hear your voice god you know that i am a sin i am in sin i am a sinner i fall short every day every moment of every day i fall short of your glory god but i want to walk in what you have father this house we want to walk in what you have for us we want to thirst for you we want to hunger for you God, as you bring the hammer down, blow by blow on the sword, what it, just blow by blow and, and 
back in the fire and then and then the crushing and then the fire and then the crushing. God, whatever the final work is, we want to walk in it, God. We want to get there. We want to get to that finish line, God. We want to get to that finish line that you could receive glory from what from what whatever is left of our lives, God, and whatever is left of us, God. We want to give you glory today, God. Show us what you want us to walk in. Even as even as I know the people in this house and the people in this room are going through things and they're going through measures, God, it's the it's the steps in the ordinary days, God, that that press us to the end. So, Father, press us, crush us, put us in the fire. Whatever it is, God, we just want to hear your voice, God. We just want to know who you are. We want to know who you are in this place, in this time. We don't want to wait. 50 years until we're on the other side, God. We want to know you now. We want to know you in this house. I want to know what that word means, God. I want to see what the next step is, God. I want to hold your hand and walk into that next step, God. So you come in this house today. You speak to your people the way you would choose to speak to them, God. You are God. You are our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many love Pastor Brent? Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. (laughs) Hallelujah. You know, I love it when God works like that. (laughs) When God just seamlessly brings a word together like that and and makes sure that the, the body hears it through not only testifying it to one, but then bringing it into the prayer before the, the message so that just a, a reassurance, a confirmation that God wanted that word delivered. I want to encourage you to hold on to that word. Um, the Lord is speaking right now in a lot of warfare terms. He's speaking quite a lot right now about the sword and the shield and the armor and the battle. And I really believe that that's the season that we're in. And in the midst of the season that we're in, the prophetic is going to be a crucial part of the season. Um, I, I just want to be honest with you with what God's been sharing with me. And, and God confirmed this to Pastor Brent and I uh, last Sunday when we were praying over folks on the prayer carpet at the end of the service. God confirmed to us that it was time for us to restart the prophetic team in this house. Because the Lord is wanting to bring the prophetic mightily back into our services. And today, I believe this is just a glimpse. This is just a glimpse. So I've asked Pastor Brent, um, who was a part of the former prophetic team, to lead the new prophetic team in this house. And uh, God's already starting to talk to to him and and to me about people that he wants to be on that team. Um, So you're going to get approached um, if the Lord is speaking your name as regard, in regards to this prophetic team, because we want to be obedient to the Lord. Amen? And how many know that the end times church has got to hear the voice of God? We've got to be a church that receives all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, all of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and that's totally open to any moving of the Holy Spirit. We've got to do this. We've got to have the seers. We've got to have the prophets. We've got to have the apostles and the evangelists, the preachers, the teachers. We need all of the gifts flowing in this house. So the Lord says the prophetic team is going to rise again, hallelujah, in this house. So I want you to be praying about that. I want you to be praying about that. And uh, Pastor Brent, I, I normally would not do this publicly, um, but I'm, I'm going to put this out there. Victoria, the Lord has been speaking to me about you all morning long. And the Lord has been using the word forerunner with you, forerunner with you. There are paths that many are going to follow that somebody had to be the forerunner to blaze that trail. And the Lord wants you to know there are certain paths that you're wanting to see people walk in in your generation. There are certain paths that you want to walk in for where you're at in your generation. And the Lord says you're going to be a forerunner in many of those paths. You're going to have to walk them first. And when you walk them first, others are going to follow. So I want you, Pastor Brent, and I want you, Victoria, to be praying about you being part of our prophetic team. 
and let's see what God says. But I really believe this is the heart of the Lord. I really believe that. And I, and, and I know that you are longing, okay, and, and your mama kind of told on you uh, about this, so this is not a prophetic word. But your mama told on you that, that you drove separately today, um, and you had your reasons for that. But one of those being because there's not really any college-age kids in this house right now. You're the forerunner for them to come. You're the forerunner for them to come. And God wants you to pray them in. God wants you to bring them in. And God wants you to be here so they can see you when they come in. Because you're a forerunner for that. Not just that. There are several things that God wants you to forerun in this house. And in this house, God wants to begin to set up some mentors in your life. And I believe Pastor Brent's one of those to begin to pour some things into you and to begin to teach you some things and to begin to grow you in some things. I really, really believe that in the Lord. And of course, your folks have a role in that and agreement and all that, and we know this. But I really feel that God is speaking that today. So I want you to really pray about that. But the things that you want to see even in this house, some of them God says, I want to bring through her. I want to bring through her. So you've got to stand in for it, believing that it's going to come. And it's not just more folks your age. There's a lot more to it because you walk in a seer anointing. You walk in a prophetic anointing. I mean, there's a multifaceted mantle that's on you. God wants this to be the place where that mantle is really nurtured and brought into a fullness in this house. And then from there, God's going to use that mightily outside of this house but this house god wants to be a training ground for you and a proving ground for you if you're willing to do so and if you're not willing to do so i'm going to pray for you until you're willing to do so hallelujah but i believe you're willing to do so so the lord says you're the answer to your own prayer in some of these areas it's you standing in it and you being willing to do it. You, you being willing to call them in, draw them in, pray them in, stand for them coming in. Because God says they're coming. He says they're coming. Whenever God does something major, there's always a forerunner. The Lord Jesus didn't even come until the forerunner came. So if the Lord himself didn't come until the forerunner came, that shows you how crucial the forerunners are. You are a forerunner in your generation. You didn't choose it. God chose it for you. And if you would understand how consuming this is going to be, you might not have chosen it for yourself if you had the chance to. But but what God has for you, you have to walk in it because so many other people's destinies are tied into it. And you're not doing this just for yourself. You're doing it for all that are going to come after you on the trail. Because there's some that want to get from point A to point B in the Lord. But as they get to point A and they look, if they don't see a pathway to point B, they're not going to blaze it. They're going to, step, they're going to sit right there and stop. But if they can look and they can see a pathway, then they'll move forward. God says you're the one that's going to blaze the pathway. He says, for such a time as this, when he talks about you, for such a time as this, he says, perhaps all this has happened, and he's talking all the way back in your childhood. He says, perhaps all this has happened, Victoria, for such a time as this, for such a time as this, for such a time as this. He's laying down before you today an open door, and he's saying, for such a time as this. You were obedient in something this last week. God wants to show you the fruit of that obedience. And God wants to bring you into some deeper things. I hear God saying visitations. I hear God saying heavenly encounters. I hear God saying some pretty radical things about you. Do you want it? It's between you and him. But I know this, God wants you on this prophetic team. God wants to raise you up in some things in this house. And God's saying it's time. He's saying it's time. He's saying it's time. You're even going to blaze a pathway that your own parents are going to follow in some ways. Even a child shall lead them. It's crucial that you lay hold of what's laid hold of you so that that can then lay hold of others. And that's heavy. 
That's well, that's an '80s term, isn't it? <laughs> '80s flashback. It's heavy. What God has for you. But literally in the Old Testament, when the glory of God would come, the Hebrew word for glory literally meant the weight of God. W-E-I-G-H-T, the weight of God. And the glory of God would come in and people would breathe heavy. <gasps> because the, the glory of God was so weighty. Not only is the glory of God weighty, the call of God is weighty. It weighs on you. But God put it on you when he puts you when he saw your unformed body and put your unformed body together in the secret place, God called you to this. And God called this to you for such a time as this. You have to walk in it or others are not going to know how to get there. And it all just starts with the next step. I believe the next step is, is yes, Lord. It's the prophetic team. It's some mentoring. It's some things being drawn out of you that it's time to be drawn out of you. And I find it amazing that God's going to use a teenager to minister to a whole lot of adults in this place. I find that pretty amazing, but I find that to be our God. He says, the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong. He says, I use the weak things to confound the strong. I use the simple things to confound the wise. So why not you? Why not you? Why not you for such a time as this? The Lord is good, isn't he? Amen. Hallelujah. And I didn't say that to embarrass you. I just already consider you a daughter in this house. <clears throat> and that God brought you here, not just as baggage with your parents, but somebody who's going to be transformational in this house. That's the way I see you. Okay? Uh, she's real uncomfortable with that. I can see that. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Whew. How many want to continue to hear from the Lord today? Amen. Today we're going to talk about, whew, whew, man, the heart of God for a generation. I just felt his heart for a generation. He's calling out the forerunners. In every generation right now, he's walking the earth. He's calling out the forerunners. We've got to walk in the calling. Hallelujah. Today we're going to talk about as much as the Lord will let us talk about crossing over into God's calling on your life. And this is a message that just keeps changing because God just keeps changing it from the, from the moment that he exposed me to this message. It, God's just been changing it. And he's been using this message to change me. And I know he's going to use this message to change you. Because this, there, you know, as a pastor, you preach a lot of messages. You do a lot of teaching. There's a lot of words that, that, you, that you teach because you know it grows the people of God. There's a lot of messages that you preach because you know that they're going to touch the hearts of people of God. But every once in a while, God brings something that you just know is different. It's transformational. You just know it from the moment God starts speaking it. And you just know it from the moment God starts speaking it through you. That it's a word that's going to bring a transition. That it's going to bring a word that's going to open a door and close another. That it's a word that's going to bring a, a crossing over from one dimension into another. Can I hear an amen? And, and I believe that's what this word is today. You know, as we were worshiping and praising the Lord, it's some of the things the Lord was speaking today, even in the midst of the warfare. And by the way, when the warfare comes during praise and worship, we can't lay down. When warfare meets us at the door, it's time to pull out the sword and oil the shields and get ready for battle. Because if the enemy brings warfare and our response is to lay down, then he knows any time anytime he wants us to lay down, then he just brings the warfare. How many know he's like a security guard walking around during the night checking doorknobs to see what doorknob is open so that he can come in? He'll bring things to try to figure out what works. And if we lay down during warfare, then he knows what works. So I want to encourage everybody, and this is not a negative word, but the next time we feel that, let's press through it together as one man until that thing breaks off. And when that thing breaks off, then let's press even harder, amen? Hallelujah, because this is the Lord's house. And how dare the enemy try to bring warfare to the Lord's house? 
This is a sacred place to the Lord. Amen? One of the things I heard the Lord saying this morning was, especially with Dana gave us the theme this morning at one point in the praise and worship of fire. I don't know if you caught that or not, but we had a fire theme. I heard the Lord say, Andrew, I'm an all-consuming fire. And I said, yes, Lord, I see that in your word. You, you just state that. You're an all-consuming fire. He said, but Andrew, why is it that this generation, and God wasn't just talking about one age group. God was talking about the generations that are still walking the earth right now and breathing. But he was talking about that as if they were just one generation. If we can get a picture of that. He says, why does this generation feel that they can receive a calling from the God who's the all-consuming fire and not have this calling consume them completely? And I said, well, God, I think I know what you're talking about, but God, can you give me more? He said, Andrew, I don't have any part-time callings. He says, there's no part-time callings in the kingdom. He says, why does this generation think they have a Sunday morning calling? Why does this generation think they have a conference calling? Why does this generation think that the calling turns on and turns off? The Lord says, I am putting on this generation an all-consuming call. And he said, it's going to consume every bit of who they are. And I heard the Lord start saying, Daniel, Paul, Peter, David. And the Lord kept going on and on. Esther, Ruth. The Lord said, I put calls on their life that consumed everything. They didn't just walk in the call when they wanted to. They didn't just walk in the call when it was convenient. They didn't just walk in the call when they wanted to. They felt like touching a bunch of people. No, God put a call on their life that changed everything. The direction of their life completely. Until all that they had left was them and that consuming God and the consuming calling that he placed on their life. I heard the Lord say, Andrew, if you saw Daniel's life, you wouldn't think it was balanced. Because he came before me morning, noon, and night. Because my calling on his life even went to his dinner table. Because my calling on the life took him to lion's dens. My call on his life consumed everything. <clears throat> Many saw his life and thought his life was completely imbalanced. He said what they saw was the all-consuming fire. And they didn't understand what they saw. The Lord says, my calling on this generation will be an all-consuming fire. And the Lord says, if you're really going to walk in it, you're not going to be able to do it part-time. You're not going to be able to do it halfway. And you're not going to be able to have part of your own life and then God's calling. God says, I and my jealousy will consume it all. Who is willing to give all for the sake of Christ? Anybody remember the old hymn we used to sing? I surrender all. It's a wonderful old Baptist hymn, but it went across some denominations. We'd sing it during altar call. I surrender all. Anybody remember that? I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. You know, one day after a service, after a wonderful service filled with the power and presence of God, I walked out of that service and I hear, heard the Lord say, Andrew, why do my people sing songs that they don't mean? Why do they sing to me songs that they don't really mean? And I said, God, what are you talking about? He said, you guys sang a song about surrender in that service today. How many people really surrendered all? How many people really meant it? How many are willing, really willing to receive me as the all-consuming fire? How many really want a God that's an all-consuming fire in their life? He said, Andrew, not many really want to be consumed. So why is it in Daniel's generation, we saw Daniel and we saw Hazariah, Mishael and Azariah, and we saw a few others, but that was it. Out of all that were in their generation, same thing in David's time, same thing in the disciples' time. Why did we seem to see so few that were really consumed for God? It's because so few are really willing to be totally consumed for their God. So what's the level in your life that you're willing to allow God and his call to consume you? Because the call of God is becoming very urgent. 
the time is becoming very short and God is beginning to speak in terms that many in the church are going to be uncomfortable with. Terms like total surrender, all-consuming, give me everything, I want it all. God's beginning to speak like the possessive, jealous lover because the time is short and the forerunners must begin to run the pathways. Does anybody believe that today? This is what the heart of the Lord is saying. How are we as the church going to respond? Are we going to give him a halfway response? Lord, I want your calling, but I also want this, 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 and this, and this. I want a part of my life to still be my own. I still want to lay some of my own boundaries. I still want to do some, my, some things my way. God's going to begin to say to the church, it's my way or the highway. You're either going to do this thing my way or, or this thing going to work. God is an all-consuming fire. Can I hear an amen? And it will weigh on you. And this calling will wear on you. And if you do this, things God's, this thing God's way, it will cost you everything. That's the way this was designed. Everything. Jesus gave everything for the sake of the call. And then what did he say after he completed the work? He said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. What do we think that means? I think we think signs, wonders, miracles, powerful things. What we don't lay hold of and what Jesus was saying was dying, surrendering, letting it all go, becoming completely his, getting to the Garden of Gethsemane, the place of the crushed olive, and saying, Father, if it's your will, may this cup pass. But nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. That's a generation that's going to walk in power. The generation that doesn't bow down to the feet of Baal that doesn't kiss the face of an idol, but rather kisses the face of the God of Jacob and says, you are more than enough for me, Lord. I lay down my desires, my wants, and my pursuits so that you can be the all-consuming fire in my life. And God, while my generation is being consumed in the pre-fires of hell, even as we speak, God, God, I want to be wholly consumed in the fire of who you are and fulfill your purpose in my generation. Talk about a generation that signs, wonders, and miracles are going to follow. Amen? They're going to have to. <laughs> because that generation is going to be so in love with Jesus that everything that the Father gave Jesus, he's going to pour out on that generation. And they're going to walk in every single bit of it. Does anybody believe that in the Lord today? Amen. You know, the Lord was speaking to me also this morning about Moses and Joshua. He was speaking to me about that once again. You know, it's very interesting when we look at Moses, the life of Moses is much a picture of Jehovah, and the life of Joshua is much a picture of Jesus. And when the baton passed from Moses to Joshua, Joshua, who was a man of a different spirit, began to walk in things that even his mentor didn't walk in. We need to understand this. This is what God's wanting to do in this generation. Some of you have heard me say this before. The Moses generation has been passing away. That Moses generation. Look at some of the mighty men of God who had incredible ministries in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s that are now have just now gone home to be with the Lord. We can start talking about Oral Roberts, no matter what you may think about him. We can start talking about Derek Prince. We could go on and on and on and on. God's been calling that Moses generation home. Why has God been calling that Moses generation home? Because it's time to pass the baton. Because it's time to pass the baton. Are you willing to receive that? I find it very interesting that Moses' name meant to draw out or one drawn out, while Joshua's name means Jehovah is salvation, or salvation is found in no other but Jehovah. And I believe right now we are on the very cuffs of God closing the door of the Moses generation and the Joshua generation beginning to rise. And Victoria, you're part of that. 
I believe the, the, our young people in the front row are part of that. I believe the gray-haired saints in this room are part of it. Well, no, we're more of the Moses generation, right? It's not about age. It's about heart. And it's about responding to the calling of God. Can I hear an amen? We've got to see this for what it is. Let's go to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, and let's talk about this, crossing over to the calling of God on your life. I find it amazing how God can speak things that go right into the theme of what God's been speaking all week long in the times that we've had together, he and I in sermon prep, and just talking about what it was that he wanted to be released in this house today. Our God is awesome, isn't he? Amen. I want to encourage you lay hold of this word today because God wants this word to lay hold of you. Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to do this. Let's, let's stand before the Lord and we're just going to go through this first passage and we're going to stand before the Lord to honor him in this time. It's not a religious thing we do. It's an honoring thing that we do. Amen. So Joshua chapter three and verse one, the word of God says this early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim, where they went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. Where they camped before what? Where they camped before what, church? Where they camped before crossing over. God says many in the body today have been camping out. They've camped out at something that God did years ago. They've camped out at something that God did last year. They've camped out at something that God did recently. They camped out at something that they read about, heard about, heard someone talk about, but they've never seen, and they're camped out at that place. God says, no, you only camp out in preparation to cross over. The camp was never meant to be the place where you stop. It's a place of preparation before you cross over. Is anybody ready to receive this in the Lord? So the Lord says there's many in the body of Christ right now camped out. God says stop camping out and start crossing over. There's some in this room that are called. God says it's time to stop camping out and start crossing over. God says it's time. So the word says after three days, hallelujah, hallelujah, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. How many know there's order in the kingdom of God? Amen. The Lord spoke to me once and he says, Andrew, there's freedom in my order and there's order in my freedom. Isn't that cool? Which means what? Even in the spirit-filled church, we don't do whatever we want to do. We have to be led by the Holy Spirit at everything. At Azusa Street, secular reporters would show up to that revival because they wanted to write a horrible a horrible article in the paper the next day about what was going on with the revival. And they'd go to that revival and they'd get touched by the presence of God. And I've read some of the old articles. They'd say, we, don't, we didn't even know who was in charge. But there's an order in the service in the way that everything happens. You know why they didn't know who was in charge? Pastor Seymour, the pastor that the, the church where God just exploded the Azusa Street Revival in 1906, would sit up on the altar with a box on his head. Because he said, if I have a box on my head, I can't get in the way of what God's doing. After the revival ended, they interviewed him and said, Pastor Seymour, when did you notice that the revival, the great Azusa Street Revival started ceasing? And he said, that's easy. It started ceasing when I took the box off my head. How many are willing to receive that truth in the Lord today? Amen. They said, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you're to move out from your positions and follow it. What's the word from God in that portion of the passage, church? When God moves, we move. What did the ark symbolize? The presence of God. The manifest presence of God would be above the mercy seat. Hallelujah. So what did they say? When God moves, we move, is what the officer said. How many know the same should be true for us today? When God moves, we need to move. Not ask questions, not ask where we're going, not ask for the GPS coordinates. When God says it's time to move, it's time to move. Even when the time to move is just a step. Even when it's just a step. Can I hear an amen? 
And notice what he says, follow it, verse 4, then you will know which way to go. Lord, which way do I go? Well, which way is God going? Lord, which way do I go? It's the way that you're moving. Lord, which way do I go? It's where you see the glory going. That's all you need to know. Just follow. And notice what the word says. I love verse 4. If you're going to remember any verse from this entire chapter, remember this one. Then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before. See, where God's about to take you is a way you've never been before. That's why we can't camp out any longer at the familiar places. We can't camp out anymore at the denominational overtones. We can't camp out any longer being satisfied with the experiences we've already had with God. We've got to be so hungry for Him that when He moves, we follow Him, not knowing where He's going, but knowing He knows where He's going. And in the midst, He's going to take us by a way we've never been before. That's what God's speaking right now. But notice what also God says. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark and don't go near it. I find that very interesting. In the, in the truer Hebrew translation, if we look at numerically what God said, what God literally said was stay about 2,000 feet away from the ark. Isn't that interesting? About 2,000 feet away from the ark. Well, why did God want the people to stay 2,000 feet away from the ark? The manifest presence of God was there. Why not have the people right up on top of the ark? Because God wanted to teach his people that even when we're intimate with him, we should not become familiar with him. Does anybody get that? Even when we're intimate with God, we shouldn't become familiar familiar what do i mean by familiar in that familiarity forgetting the fact that he is holy that he is mighty that he is god and gets sloppy because of intimacy intimacy is not an excuse to become sloppy in the way that we approach god in fact god said to aaron tell aaron not to come before me anytime he wants to you tell Aaron to come into my presence at the appointed times. See, Aaron became familiar with God. That was the problem. And the Lord spoke a word over the church not long ago. He says, my people are too familiar with a God they don't know. Who is is that an indictment against the church? Well, pastor, you're beating us up today. Well, thanks for coming through the snowstorm. Hallelujah. I'm just going to say what God says to say, and if you're getting beaten up, I'm getting beaten up in the process too. Hallelujah. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Amen. Hallelujah. Now notice what he says. He says, I want you to keep a distance of about 2,000 feet between you and the ark. Don't go near it. Don't be too familiar, the Lord said. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Hold on now. If you're going to remember another verse, this is it. Joshua told the people two things. He said, number one, consecrate yourself. In the Old Testament, when God said consecrate yourself, three things had to take place. And he said it to Israel more than once. When he said through Moses, consecrate yourself, number one, the Lord was saying, wash your clothes. That was part of ceremonial cleanliness. He would say, number two, wash your bodies. And then something that could almost be a little confusing was, was the third requirement of consecration. During the time of consecration, which was typically three days, isn't it interesting the Lord was in the grave three days and then he rose again? Consecration is a picture of dying. Can I hear an amen? The third was not to have any sexual relations with anybody during that time, even husband and wife. No sexual relations. Now, you can look at that and go, what? They're, they're, folks are married. I mean, what's the big deal? We're, we're married, and, and, and so that relationship, that intimacy is completely ordained by God. Yes, it is, but you know what God was saying during the time of consecration? Be intimate with no one but me. He said, even husbands and wives, you be intimate with me during that time. 
See, consecration really isn't about us. It's about God. It, it really is. We, we've got to understand that. So number one, he says, consecrate yourselves. Notice this. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. How many have felt like God has kept saying to you, tomorrow I'll do amazing things? Tomorrow I'm going to do amazing things. Tomorrow I'm going to do amazing Let's be honest. How many have felt like that? That God speaks this prophetic word and it's always a tomorrow word. Tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. And so many of our generation are saying, when's it going to be today? Let me tell you when tomorrow becomes today. It's when you consecrate yourself and you cross over. That's when it begins to happen. Consecration is a picture of a deeper intimacy with God and a willingness because of that now to go with him where you've never allowed him to take you before. Wait a minute, I've never allowed him to take me there before? Oh, he's always wanted to take you there. Now you're going to be willing to go. Well, Pastor, I don't like the way you phrase that. Well, talk to the Lord. It's what he's saying. There's a generation right now saying he's the God of tomorrow. No, he's not. He's the God of now. We've got to consecrate ourselves and cross over, and then we're going to see those amazing things that he's been talking about. By the way, they're seeing amazing things in third world countries in the church. Why are we not seeing those amazing things? Well, they're getting up at 3 in the morning to go to meet in a cave. They're getting up at 4 in the morning to go meet in somebody's basement, and it could cost them their lives. They're hungry for him. Oh, talk about consecration. Talk about wanting to go where God wants them to go, and miracles are happening all amongst them. All these things, for tomorrow this will happen, tomorrow this will happen. It's happening anywhere where people are willing to be consecrated and really hunger for God and go after God. Can I hear it? Amen. Verse 6, and Joshua said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. What were they? Forerunners! See, how do the people know where to go if somebody hasn't crossed on before them? And the forerunners, what were they carrying? The presence of God. The glory of God. Somebody better say amen. Hallelujah. Whew. So Joshua said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and they went on ahead of them. You know, they were 2,000 feet ahead of them, but sometimes the forerunner feels like they're 2,000 years ahead of others in their generation. Forerunning is a lonely place. It's a desolate place. It's a challenging place. Let me say it again, it's a lonely place. Then the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all of Israel so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant when you reach the edge of Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Church, how many know that God doesn't usually just say go and stand in the river when the river's nice and calm? When the river's just in a beautiful place? Do you know at this point in history when, when the priests were stepping into the Jordan, it was harvest season and the river was flooded. God's never going to ask you to do it the easy way. In fact, if it's the easy way, I'd start questioning if it's God. God says, not only are you going to go into the river, priest, you're going to go in the river at flood stage where this normally tame river can kill people. You're going to go into this river during a time where nobody wants to cross this river. Guess what? The forerunners go across places or through places that nobody else would ever dare going through. But once they go to those places, the other people see there's hope. They can go there. Can I hear an amen? Go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. Notice this, church, third verse to remember. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, and the Gigabites. See, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And notice what the Lord says. He says, this is how you're going to know that the living God is among you, but it's also how the very people that I'm going to drive out are going to know that a living God is amongst you. 
because they're going to see this miracle. Well, they've heard of the Red Sea. What is another parting miracle going to do? Now, see, this is what we have to understand. How many know that God is always doing multiple things at one time? He's a multidimensional God. The people in this area are serving the God of Baal. The particular false God of Baal. The particular version of Baal that they are worshiping, they believe is the version of Baal that conquered the God of the seas. So now that Baal was in control of all the waters. Isn't that interesting? And you know what the Lord said? Take my ark and stand right in the middle of the water. Is God making a point? You bet he is. You bet he is. Hallelujah. Go stand in the middle of the waters. It's also interesting that the peoples around them had a test that they would utilize if somebody claimed that something was done to them and there was no proof, they would put them through the water ordeal. And the water ordeal was that they would go to the rivers at, or seas or whatever it was at flood stage and throw this person bound into the waters. And if that person could es escape and survive the water ordeal, it was believed in those cultures that the gods approved of them and they were telling the truth. And they would be vindicated. But you know what God says? Walk right in the middle of the river during flood stage. See, he did it not just to prove that he could get them through a flood stage river. He took them through the Red Sea, folks. What was the biggie here? God wanted to send a statement to the peoples. And I think the peoples were probably going to understand it more than Israel by the time it was done. Verse 12, now then choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord of all the earth set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing down streams will be cut off and will stand up in a heap, a wall of water. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. The forerunners went ahead so the people knew where to follow. Now the Jordan was at flood stage during all harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing and it piled up in a heap at a great distance away in a town called a dam. Isn't that interesting? Who was Adam? He was the beginning. What, is it, what did his name mean? Earth, interestingly enough. God piled up the waters all the way to a town called Adam. What was it? It was a new beginning. Can I hear an amen? In the vicinity of Zerath, what does Zer Zerthon, what does Zerthon mean in the Hebrew? A narrow dwelling place. Do you know what the Lord did? He backed up the waters in an act of new beginning for Israel. But he says to do this, you're going to have to pass through a narrow dwelling place. Your road just went from this to this if you're really going to be my people and you're really going to follow me can i hear an amen hallelujah while the water flowing down to the sea of arabath the salt sea was completely cut off so what happened upstream the water just kept building 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 not only that flooding 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 in that area water was flooding where it had never been flooding before so the people crossed over opposite jericho and the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. And when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, folks, this was a million plus people. How long does it take to get a million plus people through a dry stretch of river? This was no small undertaking. 
And there's no way that it could go on unnoticed by the people around them. And when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, holy ground, and carry them over with you and put them at the place where you stay tonight. Isn't that interesting? You know what God said? Take a little bit of the miracle with you that I did and pile it up as a, a remembrance please be seated how many are getting excited about the Lord what we have to remember as a church is that we serve the God of the impossible and when God begins to tell you about his calling on your life what he is calling you to there has to be an element of impossible to it there's got to be an element that when God says, I've called you to this, that makes you go, God, how in the world is this going to happen? That's one of the ways that you know that it's God. Because if it's something that you could do, you could make take place, that you could take care of on your own, how many know that that isn't God? Are you willing to receive that? How many know it isn't God? When God came to Abraham and Sarah, what did he do? He came in their extreme old age. He came when they were barren. He came when they'd given up. And he came with a supernatural promise, you're going to have a child. How many know through man that's completely impossible? How many know that Gabriel came to a woman who'd never known a man and said, you're going to have the Christ child? She wasn't even a woman. She was a girl. They think she was 12 or 13 years old, which was the normal age that girls would begin to be engaged to men in Israel through arranged marriages. Talk about impossible. That's why when God tells you how he wants to use you, there's got to be an element of the impossible in it because our God is the God of the impossible. We got to look at it and go, God, how in the world? And the Lord says, you just follow me when I move. You just go where I go, you just say what I say, you just do what I tell you to do, and I am going to show you that I am God. Can I hear an amen? But I think the church has forgotten that we serve the God of the impossible. I think we've forgotten that. I read just this week and this story just set me ablaze. How many like a good God story? I read this this week, a story about a pastor who was a pastor in Malaysia and he had a church of about 15 people. But it, this church was filled with the Spirit of God and miracles happened during their service. I mean, these folks were on fire for God. They were in a, a, a semi-developed city in Malaysia and they were using a building and the owner of the building came to this little group and said, okay, I'm going to start using this building for another purpose. Then I'm going to start up another business and the business is going to meet in the building and it's going to be much more profitable than what you guys are paying, so you're out. 15 people. They needed $78,000 for the building that the pastor had chosen to be the next destination of the church. It was right across the street. They felt like God called them to that area, that they were right where they're supposed to be. So instead of panicking, they prayed, and God spoke to the pastor. He said, look across the street. That's the building that I want you guys to be in next. $78,000. Now, this is in Malaysia. This is in Malaysia, so it might as well have been a million dollars that they had to raise for this thing. And 15 people in the church. So they raised money, they raised money, they raised money. They had one month to get out of the business, of the building. They raised money for that entire month, and they came up with $1,200. This true story happened just a few years back. They needed 78000 they raised 1200 So they said, okay, this is what we're going to do. Our very last night in the building, we're going to have a prayer service. And we're going to take up an offering, and we're going to trust God. We're going to trust God. So what they do is they get to the building that night. There's 15 people in the church. Seven showed up. Seven of the congregation showed up. So they just start praying. At the end of their multi-hour prayer service, the, the pastor passes this like a pouch around like you've seen in some denominations. They'll have the little, denom the, the little offering uh, almost like uh, 
uh, packet. It's got the little piece of wood, and you've got the pouch, and it'll kind of be passed around, and you can put something in the little pocket there, okay? You see how denominational I am. I can't even tell you what it's called. But anyway, they make offerings with this thing. So they pass that thing around, and it comes back to the pastor, and he looks in it, seven people, you know, just a little bit of money. He says, God, what do you want me to do? And the Lord says, I want you to start counting the money. He says, I want you to start counting the money. And he's like, okay, Lord, do you want me to go to the back room? What do you want me to do? He said, no. He says, I want you to stand in front of your congregation, seven people that night, and say to them, our God is the God of the impossible. Watch what he's about to do and just start pulling money out of the bag. So he started pulling money out of the bag and he started counting it. And by the time he was done counting, they had all $78,000 that they needed including the 1200 they'd already raised, and there's more money in the bag. He looks back in, there's still more money in the bag. They've got their 78000 He pulls out more money, okay, in the particular denomination of Malaysia, pulls out more money until they've got 900 extra. He's like, Lord, what in the world do you want us to do with this extra 900 He goes to the closing on the new building the next day, gives them the 78000 and found there was $900 in extra fees they knew nothing about that they had to pay. How many know that our God is the God of the impossible? Amen? This stuff happens. Whenever God calls you to something, there has to be an element of the supernatural in it. There has to be a realm of impossibility in the call if it's going to be God. Can I hear an amen? Let's look at, look at what the Word says, Hebrews 11. Let's go to Hebrews 11. If you've got the Word with you today, get it ready. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. How many are in love with the Lord? Amen. Hallelujah. There's going to be a realm of impossible with, in what he's called you to if it's God. Amen? If it's God. It's a sign that it's God if there's a realm of impossibility in it. Hallelujah. And how many know God's providing the building for us that we need? Let me say that again. How many know that God's providing the building for us that we need? Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. I want you to notice what the word says, Hebrews 11, 5. By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Do you know that Enoch was seven generations from Adam, if you study the genealogy? Seven generations from Adam. Well, Pastor, why do you bring that up? Because Adam, if you look at how long Adam lived, Adam was still alive in Enoch's day. Which means what? I think Enoch was a man of a different spirit. I believe Enoch was a forerunner. And I believe one day Enoch was so on fire for God that he went to Adam and he said, great, 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 grandpa. He said, what was it like? And Adam probably said, what, what, was, what was what like? What was it like to walk with God in the stillness of the garden in the evening? What was it like to hear him walking through the garden? What was it like to fellowship with him? And Enoch's heart burned within him. And that passion took him to ask that question to Adam and that Enoch purposed in his heart that he was going to know God if it was the last thing he did. How many want that passion for God? Amen? Now notice what the word says. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly or diligently seek him. Can I hear it, amen? See, this thing that God's called you to, when you start seeing the ark move and you follow it, it's got to have a, a smack of impossibility to it. If it's God, not only that, it's going to require faith. It's going to require faith. And if it, if, if it requires a small amount of faith, I'm going to ask how much God is in it. 
Because the calling that God has for your life is all-consuming. He wants to use it to consume everything. Don't start looking for what's balanced between my time and God's time. What's balanced between my dreams and God's dreams? He doesn't want balance. He wants all of you. Only one amen, and that was my wife. But isn't that a thing in the church anymore? Well, I want to find balance. What, what's balance between God and family and work and this and that and my social life and my hobbies? You know what God says? I want to take your balance and throw it out the, the window because it makes me sick. The Lord would say to us today, I didn't die on the cross so that you could have a life that people see as being balanced. The Lord died on the cross so we'd live a life that people would look at and think, what in the world is that? A lifestyle that convicts the wicked as much as it does believers. Anybody catch that? A lifestyle that convicts the wicked every bit as much as it does believers because it's so radical that even the church doesn't get it. I don't think Daniel would ever talk to you about balance. God sends him to a foreign land to minister to a wicked king and he's an example of Jehovah his whole life. There's lions, dens, there's assassination attempts, there's all kinds of things on his life. And the word doesn't even indicate he ever made it back to his homeland. Three kings utilized him in their service. Where's the balance in that? Where's the balance in Paul's life? When he starts speaking stuff like, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Today's modern church goes, whoa, 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 whoa. That, whoa, 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 whoa. Now that's a little extreme, folks. Our God's a God of balance. Yes, he is. His balance. His balance. We need not seek our balance because our balance is always going to draw mm, the measuring line it's always going to snap the the tape line in a place where god's not pleased anybody catch that see god is an all-consuming fire he wants all of us he wants that free time he wants that movie time he wants that hobby time he he wants it all and by the way your family's not going to understand it your friends aren't going to understand it people around you aren't going to understand it and if we're doing things right as a church we're going to get called a cult we have before and we have we will be again <laughs> trust me well pastor why do you say that because whenever people really get excited about jesus the folks that are satisfied with a religious walk with him start getting real nervous and i don't know about you but i want to have a christian walk that convicts the wicked and convicts the the christians all around me Pastor Brent finally smiled. It, it took halfway through the message to get him to smile. Now I'm starting to speak his language. How many are willing to amen that? Amen? But see, man always drives towards the religious, towards the things that we know, towards the things that are tangible. How many though, though the word says God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth? You know that church in Malaysia, you know what people started wanting to see once they heard about the miracle of the offering bag? Guess what they wanted to see? The offering bag. Pastor said they'd line up outside the church building because people wanted to see the offering bag. You know what he did? He burned it because it was becoming an idol. It was becoming an idol. See, isn't that what we do? Then God does something mighty, mightily and will idolize something that God did as a part of the process and will camp out there. Let's take that offering bag and let's build a beautiful case for it and a glass front and light it up and let's put it in the front of the building so whenever anybody comes in, they can see the offering bag of miracles. Miracles, miracles, miracles. You know what pastor said? This thing's taken away from Jesus. This is ridiculous. I'm going to burn this thing. How many know that God never created you to camp out? How many also know that the Lord is going to provide everything that's necessary for the calling that he's placed on your life. Amen? We just have to start getting a supernatural revelation of the power of God. 
We've got to get a supernatural revelation that God created us not to be bound by the natural realm, but to also have access to the supernatural realm so that we can visit the supernatural realm and be filled with power and might in the Lord to accomplish everything that he's called us to. Do you believe that? You know, I don't think the supernatural realm is taught on enough in the church. Because I really believe that God wants dreams, visions, angelic encounters, and heavenly visitations to be a normal part of the Christian walk. But it's not going to be a normal part of the Christian walk if we want to live out an American Christianity. It's not. What did the Lord say in the Word? He says, draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. He says, draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. What's God saying? I am the initiator, you're the respondent, but when it comes to wanting more of me, I want you to learn how to be the initiator. Draw near to me, and I'll be the respondent. Is that not amazing? I heard a word the Lord gave the church a few years back that just blew me away. I heard the, the, the Lord said this. It was absolutely amazing. He said, I have chased my bride for centuries. He says, now I want my bride to chase me. What's he really saying? I want my bride to become the initiator. I want to, I want to be the respondent. Holly and I were watching just a, a little bit of uh, television last night, and we saw a commercial that was by a jewelers that everybody would know uh, if we mentioned the name, local jeweler. But the tagline really caught my attention because it was marketed to women, and the tagline was, why don't you ask him? <laughs> Remember that? Why don't you ask him? And that was the gist of the whole commercial, showing women on one knee, asking a guy to marry them. I mean, it just absolutely blew me away. But when we were done viewing that commercial, the Lord started speaking to me. He said, Andrew, I want my bride to ask me to marry them. I want my bride to pursue me. Where's my bride that will storm the bedroom chamber before the wedding feast of the Lamb and say, Jesus, I want to marry you now. Folks, when you get married, your life is no longer your own. Married folks, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Folks that have been married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Single folks, just trust me. Your life is no longer your own. It's not. There's somebody else in the picture. And now your responsibility is to help meet their needs. Marriage to Jesus is no different. When we marry him, our life is no longer our own. Anybody like that uh, praise and worship song we did earlier that starts talking about the, the violent pursuit of the Lord? Wasn't that the phrase, you violently pursue me? Whoa. That way I just stopped and went, oh, that's really good. That's really good. You violently pursue me. Where's the generation that will violently pursue God? He said, and since that time, the kingdom of heaven has been taken by force, and forceful saints take it. Or since that time, the kingdom of heaven has been taken by violence. Where's the generation that are going to be so violent that they storm the throne room of God and demand marriage to Jesus? Where's that generation that's going to go that boldly before the throne of God? I say in the name of Jesus, we're that generation. How many look at the life of Joshua and think, man, I'd love to be used by God like that? As a conqueror, as a mighty man of God like that. Let me give you a little insight into the life of Joshua. And uh, you can chew the meat on this one and, and spit out the bone. Some of you have heard me say this before. But there was a time... When the Lord had me involved in deliverance with people that came out of the occult. So not just Joe Christian who's in church battling lust or, you know, Sister Susie who's battling with this. But the Lord had me praying over folks that literally came out of the occult. One of the folks that I had the privilege of praying over had literally been a bride of Satan. Married to Satan himself uh, in a ceremony and then had encounters with him. And then by a miracle of God came to the Lord. 
and got to pray with that person. So how many know when you're praying with those kind of folks, they're going to have just a little deeper, a <laughs> little deeper manifestation going on that you're just going to encounter a little bit more with those folks. Prayed with one of those people uh, once a week for seven years, fighting for their freedom. But what I found out during those times is that when you start praying over somebody that's come out of the occult, especially that's been a bride of Satan, they, not just, they don't just have demons that have been assigned to them. They have fallen angels that have been assigned to them. Now, that's, this starts getting into demonology, and this is a whole other teaching. But many in the church just take all of the enemy's workers and they just call them demons. Or they just call them the fallen ones. They don't really distinguish. I really believe in the word, and you can study the word on this and take it to the Lord. And I'm not trying to make a denominational statement here. I'm just telling you what I experienced. And that is I experienced a real difference between fallen angels during those sessions and demons. So the word says that when the enemy fell, he took one-third of the angels with him. Those angels had roles that God gave them. And when they fell, whatever the role was that God gave them, the enemy perverted that and made them the opposite. So if, a, if an angel had been a guardian angel, the enemy made him a destroyer. If the angel had been an angel that brought the word of God, then the enemy would pervert that and have them bring false words. And God literally allowed me to have a few conversations with these fallen angels. It, during deliverance sessions, the Lord actually allowed me to kind of indulge a little bit and ask a few questions. I learned more in those times that backed up the word of God than I've learned anywhere else. And it absolutely amazed me. And I found when having a conversation in these sessions with a fallen angel that fallen angels were very deep, were very knowledgeable. They've been around since before creation and you could just tell that you were speaking to something that had depth almost like taking a pebble and throwing it into a deep well and sploonk, these things had depth to them i really believe believe demons came around as counterfeit creation of the enemy and i believe the enemy made the majority of the demons and i believe some came about through man's sin like cain killed abel and i believe demons of murder were birthed out of that but they're completely different things Demons are not as intelligent at all as fallen angels. They're counterfeit creation. The enemy sets them in motion, and that's all they, they know is just destruction and what the enemy sets them on. I found the fallen angels actually had a little personality. They actually regretted turning their back on the Father. It was very, very interesting. And every once in a while, the Lord would let me talk to one that would really give me some insight and so I was talking to one once in one of these deliverance sessions. I'm not talking about half an hour. I'm talking about a couple minutes and then go in the name of Jesus. And this one came up and it was a, a conquering fallen angel. And this thing was designed to keep this person suppressed and not able to get out of this place of seeing themselves as being a bride of Satan and all of this stuff. So they couldn't see themselves as being really truly saved, truly belonging to God now. That's what this thing did. And so this thing came up and the Lord had me do the binding and the cutting and everything that needs to, needed to be done. And about the time that uh, I was going to say in the name of Jesus, now you go and that thing was going to go, it was very interesting that the Holy Spirit started talking to me about Joshua. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, this fallen angel was actually one of the fallen angels that fought Joshua through the peoples when he came into the promised land. And I just went, whoa, Lord, is it? And I didn't even get out the okay, and the Holy Spirit said, ask. So I said, in the name of Jesus, were you one of the fallen angels that fought on the people's side against Israel and they came in the promised land? And I said, yes. And, and I said, Wow. I said, you must have hated Joshua. And that thing looked at me and it smiled and it said, we hated him. And then it said, and we admired him. And I said, why did you admire him? And it said, because he wouldn't give up. I said, have you faced anyone like him since? 
And it looked at me and it said, we've faced weak men since. Weak men that give up. And it was that, at that very moment, I purposed in my heart that I wanted to be like Joshua. Because I never want a fallen angel to speak of this house and say weak. And say weak. Folks, we're in a battle. We're in a battle. You know, it amazes me in the word that God gave Pastor Brent today. He was talking about swords. Well, big surprise, Pastor Brent and swords. But it's very interesting. He was talking about forging of the sword. Do you know, I studied the sword making process a little bit. It's a conversation Brent and I actually haven't had yet. But I, I stu I've studied the sword making process. And not only is the forging of the blade important, if a sword was really being made for someone that was of royalty or nobility or a knight or someone that was very wealthy, literally the, the sword maker would, would fit or tailor the hilt. The hilt would be the portion of the sword that you hold on to, would tailor it to the hand of the person he was making it for. It had a custom-made hilt or handle so that anybody else that picked up that sword to use it, it wouldn't feel right to them. But for the person it was made for, it was their sword. Isn't that interesting? I studied that because we had a service where God started prophetically speaking and talking about the fact that he wanted to make this church his sword and that through all the warfare he was taking us through, he was fashioning the hilt so no one else could swing us in battle but God himself. Woo! Oh, oh man, did I just feel the presence of the Lord in waves. Is that not cool? And the Lord said every battle he was taking us through made us fit his hand perfectly. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. So why was Joshua able to go in and conquer? Moses saw Shihon and Og, and he saw a few kings, you know, east of the Jordan. But Joshua was the one who went through the Jordan and conquered the nations. 32 dynasties were conquered by Joshua dynasties reigned by, reigned over by 32 different kings who had multiple cities in their area i mean that was something 32 dynasties how was he able to do that let me give you some insight let's go in the book of, of uh, exodus and let's go to exodus 33 and i think there's one verse in the entire word that tells us exactly why god was able to use joshua the way God was able to use Joshua. Exodus 33, 11. And may this verse set you on fire in the name of Jesus. And I just decree and declare over you in the name of Jesus that God is going to use you and this message in you to bring you to a place of crossing over. Amen? Hallelujah. I want you to notice what Exodus 33, 11 says. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. But his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Dana, can you give this to us in the amplified version, please? I want you to notice what the word says. This is so cool. This is why God was able to use Joshua the way that he was. And the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Moses returned to the camp, but his minister Joshua, son of, son of Nun, a young man, did not part from the tent, the place of prayer. He did not leave until every bit of the presence of God was gone. See, Moses was, knew God as a friend. The word calls Moses a friend of God. Joshua was a lover. He was intimate with God. I'm going to say this in love and understand it as I say it. Friendship with God will only take you so far. 
friendship is designed to be a level that you experience with God on your way to intimacy. Anybody remember the training on the covenants that we had? We enter in as a servant. Then we become the friends of God. Then we grow into becoming the sons of God. Then we become the bride of our God. See, Moses was a friend of God, but he only went so far. Joshua finished the conquest. See, Moses was a friend of God, and he became familiar with God to the point where God said, speak to the rock, and he struck it. People ask me in Bible studies, well, why did he not get to see the promised land? Because he struck the rock. Well, number one, keep in mind, he didn't go to the promised land, but he went to the promised land. Amen? Don't forget that. So he didn't do too bad, folks. But there's a place where friendship can lead to familiarity. And familiarity is not good when it comes to God. You don't want to be familiar with God. You want to know God. You want intimacy with God. Is anybody catching that? That's why when I pray, I don't pray, God, I want to know your ways. See, that's familiarity. God, I want to know your heart. That's intimacy. Your generation's the Joshua generation. And you're going to go farther than what your mentors have gone. But it's important that you get mentored because that mentoring brings forth an outpouring within you that then God is going to take so much further. So important. Joshua's anointed as he was, serve Moses faithfully. Some of the greatest leaders were yesterday's greatest servants. We've got to understand that. So he learned everything he could from Moses, but yet he still remained true to who God called him to be. Because when Moses left the presence, he didn't go out with Moses to learn how to deliver a good speech. He stayed in the tent until every bit of the presence was gone. That's what separated him from Moses. That's what's going to make this generation different. That's why this isn't about gray hair or dark hair. This isn't about teenager or senior. This is about are you one of the ones that stays in the tent until every bit of the presence of God is, of God is gone. That's the Mason-Dixon line. That's the line of demarcation. That's what determines it. If you are one that stays in the tent of meeting until every bit of the presence of God is gone, you're a Joshua. If you're just happy with a friendship with God, you're a Moses. And it's time for us to cross over the river and to become the people that God's called us to be. Are you willing to receive that in the Lord? It's time for us to cross the river and become the people that God calls us to be. Joshua was a man of the presence and in the presence, God was preparing him while Moses was grooming him to begin to walk in things that he didn't even realize he was going to walk in. Your generation is going to walk in things that you've never even read about in the Word. Okay, now, Pastor, I'm getting uncomfortable with that. Well, now, wait a minute. If we went to the book of John, the Gospel of John, you know what John says at the very end of his Gospel? I suppose if everything that Jesus did were written in books, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it all. Which means what? We've got what God wants us to know right now. And I think a little bit man interfered with and pulled a little bit out. But that's a whole other message. Okay? But you're going to do greater than what Jesus did. Greater is going to get into what John was talking about. And that was just in a three and a half year ministry. All the books in all the world couldn't contain what Jesus did in the three and a half year ministry. You know what that means? Things were going on all the time. I mean, riot or revival was breaking out wherever Jesus went. I mean, these guys were ruined 
by what God did in front of them. They were ruined. You know, God wants to begin doing things to you and through you that's going to ruin you forever. So that you become like the old prophet who said, Lord, you tricked me. You ever read that before? Lord, you ruined me. You made it so I couldn't be satisfied with anybody but you. You know exactly what you were doing, God. But see, we've got to understand this. We've also got to understand that in the midst of this process of crossing over the Jordan, we die. Because the Jordan River was going to become the very river where John the Baptist would baptize millions of people. Josephus estimated that over 6 million people came out to visit John in the wilderness. Josephus was a Jewish historian. Over 6 million people. What is baptism? It's a picture of dying and being brought back to life with Christ. Can I hear an amen? See, when you go through the Jordan River, you die at that point. And I find it very interesting that the term Jordan literally means the place of death and descending. Is that not interesting? Six million people were baptized in the place of death and descending. What? How many hear that and go, whoa, I thought Jordan would mean something beautiful like gateway to paradise. No, it means the place of dying. See, we've got to understand, Paul said something so powerful <laughs> when he says that I died with Christ, I was buried with Christ, and I'm risen with Christ. Isn't that baptism? And the very river that Joshua, whose name means God is salvation, walked through that began his destiny. All, everything up to that point was preparation, would be the very same river that Yeshua would be baptized in, and then his earthly ministry would begin. Both Joshua and Jesus had to be baptized in the river of dying. Is that sobering to anyone? The river of descending. I mean, that river was so uninviting that remember Naaman in the book of Kings? The prophet says, go dip in the Jordan River seven times, and he didn't want to do it. Well, the reasons why he didn't want to do it was it wasn't just a river. It was a river that was used for sewage and a river that was used for garbage disposal and a river that was not a real pleasant river. That's why Naaman said, are, are not Abana and far, far the rivers of my land so much better than the Jordan River? And then his servant says to him, Master, if the prophet had asked you to do something difficult, wouldn't have you have done it? But yet he asks you to do such a simple thing. Bathe in the Jordan seven times. See, the mighty Assyrian warrior would dip in that river seven times and have his leprosy taken away. Do you think the Jordan River is important? <laughs> we all have to go through it and die. Joshua was never the same after he crossed over the Jordan. He was never the same. You're never the same after you finally become willing to die for Christ. Let me say this again. You're never the same until you're actually willing to come and die in Christ. Am I going to get an amen? See, we, we, we've got to see this for, for what it is. We've got to see this for what it is. The Jordan River really is a picture it's a picture of transitioning from one realm to another. Now, don't, don't check out on me yet. I don't even think it's snowing yet. I'm decreeing that in Jesus' name. Don't check out on me yet. The Jordan River was a picture of transitioning. Transitioning from the wilderness into the promised land. Transitioning from death into to new life transitioning from the way things were into God's calling on your life, transitioning from the natural to the supernatural. 
How many are willing to receive that in the Lord? Okay, please don't answer this question. How many here have been willing to let the Lord take you to the Jordan River and baptize you in the river of dying? Many are called, few are chosen. See, we've got to understand this. But it's at the Jordan River that we enter in. It's where we go from walking in the flesh to walking in the Spirit. We really begin to enter in at the Jordan. Why? Well, isn't this the conundrum of Christianity? You've got to die so that you can live. What does the world say? Live, 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 live life to the fullest. And then when you die, you know you've done everything that can be done. And you've lived a full life. What does Christianity say? Die so that you can live. Is anybody getting this? This is not taught to us at salvation. We have to die so that Christ can live. Can I hear an amen? You know what God really is calling us to do is to enter in. Is to enter in. How many really have entered in? Jesus talked about that concept in his ministry over and over again about entering into the kingdom, entering into the kingdom. How many remember the rich young ruler? Rich young ruler comes to the Lord. Lord, what must I do to be saved? And the Lord mentioned some commandments. And Lord, I've done all that since I was a child. Jesus said, you've almost entered in. How many is that in the church? You've almost entered in to the kingdom. You're almost there. Okay, Lord, what else do I need to do? Sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. Oh. <coughs> Modern translation. Give up your career and go into ministry. Modern translation. Give up your dreams and pick up mine, the Lord says. Modern translation. Stop loving money and so many other things and start loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know what amazes me? The, the word says he was bewildered and then he walked away. But the word says, but Jesus loved him. You know what that means? God's heart is for this generation. God's heart's for all those college kids you want to see come here. God's heart's for all these teenagers and middle schoolers we want to see come here god's heart is for that generation if that generation escaped the womb without being pulled apart through an abortive practice the enemy tried to destroy them the moment they got out through wrecked families fatherlessness motherlessness addiction being dropped off at an aunt or uncle's house while mom or dad starts another family and forgets about them the enemy has tried to destroy this generation but god looks at them just like the rich young ruler and he loves them because they're the generation that's really going to enter in and cause the return of Christ. Can I hear an amen? You know, I find it interesting that Jesus looked at the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he said to them, you hypocrites, he said, you neither enter in, nor do you allow those who desire to enter to enter in. Isn't that interesting? That's what Jesus said. What is he talking about entering into? Everything that's a covenant right that God promised you. Everything. See, here's part of the problem. We don't understand the covenant. God's going to have me do more teaching on the covenant in this upcoming year. He's already told me that. But what's the Lord talking about? Entering in. What, what did Nicodemus ask him? Lord, what must I do to enter into the kingdom of heaven? What must I do to enter in? What did Jesus say? You must be born again. Can I hear an amen? That's what he said. But being born again just gets you in the door. It just gets you in the door. We've now got to lay hold of all of the promises that God has given us. And by the way, the word says that God is not a respecter of persons. What he'll do for one, he'll do for another. Which means everything that we saw God do in people's lives in the word can be ours. Hey! Is anybody excited about that? It is ours! Okay, Lord. John was, was 
who's on the, the Isle of Patmos, pri- imprisoned there, and on the third day he was in the Spirit, and he heard you say, come up here, and he visited the, her- the third heaven. It's a covenant, right? You did it for him? You're not a respecter of persons? I want it! So is that what we do? Is a little child just stand there and demand it like a little kid wanting a Barbie in a five and dime store? I want it. I want No, 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 no. Exodus 33, 11. And he stayed in the tent of meeting until every bit of the presence of God was gone. Pursue him, pursue him, pursue him, pursue him. And when his presence about, is about to leave the room, lay hold of his presence and pull him back in. Well, how can you talk about Jesus like that? Oh, he wants us to do that. How many services does the presence of God wane? And we go, okay, we're, God's, God's done today. And is God allowing his presence to wane because he wants us to lay hold of his presence and pull him back in the room? How do we pull him back in? Hunger in our heart. Praise, worship, crying out like Abraham. Don't pass me by! I can't live without you, Jesus. Don't leave the room because you're my breath. Don't, when are we going to get that desperate for God? Folks are going to see that and go, man, that's not balanced. It's not. God's not a God who wants man's balance. He wants his balance. That's why the Lord says a, a dishonest balance is an abomination to him. Maybe he's talking about the lifestyle of most in the church. Well, Pastor, I don't like the way you're preaching today. Well, the Holy Ghost is preaching. Can I hear an amen? You know, I find it interesting that we have to come into this realization. If God did it for one person, then he'll do it for us. Because if he did it for them, then it's part of the covenant. So you look at whoever you want to look at, and if they're moving in something you want to move in, it's ours as a covenant right. But here's the thing. You are seeing the end product of what God has taken them through. You are seeing the end product. So I read a great, uh, part of a great book, that a really neat prophetic guy was was uh, right he had written and if I mention his name you know exactly who he was and uh, well known preaches all over spot on spot on man of God and walks in a prophetic anointing most people would want so he said one day he was walking through an airport and and a, a young adult recognized him on fire for God was this young adult recognized him he, he was in ministry school was giving his life to the lord he was so excited and he comes up to this guy he says you're so and so and the old prophet says to them well, yeah yeah i am he says i love your work i've read your book i've listened to your sermon i want to walk in the anointing that you walk in will you pray to god that god will give it to me and he said well, well sure i will son and uh the young man says no i mean right here right here in the airport i want this right now so the old prophet you know lays hands on this young man and finds out what his name is and and he starts praying lord i just come before you right now with so and so and mentions his name lord he wants to walk in the anointing that i walk in so lord right now i ask that you would bring him to a place where he dies Lord, to a place where you absolutely crush his hopes and his dreams. Lord, that you would bring him to a place where he is so broken in you that he can barely cry out in prayer. And the young man stops and goes, wait! Whoa! That's not what I asked you to pray for. True story. And the prophet said, no, that's not what you asked me to pray for. He said, what you asked me to pray for was that God would give you what he's given me without all the work and the effort and the pain and the trial and the brokenness. That's what you asked for. And the young man went, oh. And then the wise old prophet said, 
and I will not ask God to give it to you without what I went through to get it. Because if God gave it to you without what I went through, you'd be dangerous with it. Because he says, with the fire comes a seasoning. With the breaking comes a maturity. With the pain comes a power. And he said, you've got to realize that. He said, the young man looked at him and walked away. And he said he could tell by the look on the young man's face, he understood. He understood. You know, we live in a generation right now where people just say, God, I, I want you to give me visitation. And God says, you know what? I need to break you before you can visit. I need to take you through some things before this can happen. Do you want it? Yeah, I want it. Okay, are you willing then to go through what you have to go through in order for me to be able to manifest this in your life? You know, it amazes me that Joshua took a new generation into the promised land. We're not a new generation. We're the last generation. So how much more does God want to move in the last generation than he did in Joshua's generation? Come on now. Somebody want to amen that? That means we're going to do and see what no other generation before us has. Do you dare to believe? Come on with me. Dare to believe this. Dare to believe this. Dare to believe that if we are willing to continue to be broken, if we're willing to continue to pour out, if we're willing to continue to bleed for the sake of Christ, if we're really willing to die, that we're going to see and do what no generation before us ever has. How many will dare believe that with me? But that's everything that the enemy pushes you down, boxes you in, pushes you around so that you won't aspire to it. So that you won't dare even dream that it's possible when the word says, I has not seen, ear has not heard, nor mind imagined what I have in store for those who love me. Can I hear an amen? You know, I find it interesting that Joshua is a type Throughout the Old Testament, we see men and women that were types. Their lives were a picture of someone that was to come. It's very interesting that Joshua was a type of Christ. He was a picture of Jesus. In fact, his name, Joshua, could also be interpreted Jeshua or Yeshua. It's a variant of the very name Jesus. Well, what blasphemy that Joshua's mother would name him Yeshua? Well, no, women, Israelite women, once they understood the prophecy that you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin, would name their kids Yeshua or Joshua or Jesus in hope that the Messiah would come soon. So this wasn't blasphemy on the part of his mom to, to call him Joshua. He was a picture. Amen? He was a picture of Christ. And guess what? People were drawn to him and they followed him everywhere he went. See, when we begin to really walk in the true power and anointing and love of the unhindered, undiluted Jesus, all things are possible. Can I hear an amen? You know, I read a story the other day. I haven't told many stories lately. This message is just full of them. It must be I had a little more time to spend with the Lord this week. But, um, and they're not the old stories, Cindy. Praise God. New stories. And he's going, yes. So I read a story this week about a young man who was called by God at a very young age and knew from the time that he was just a boy that God called him to preach. He had angelic visitation from the time he was a teenager. Somebody's got to go, oh, I want that. Are there any oh's in the room with me? I want that. And said that uh, while he was a teenager, he worked on a farm. And he worked for a, a, a farmer who was an old man of God. I mean, loved God, was a pillar in the community, was at church every day, knew the word of God, knew the ways of God, knew the heart of God, was just an amazing, amazing old farmer. And uh, he said one day during harvest, in the story that I read, the young man who is now 18 years old 
um, was working in the harvest time with the dry stalks. And the farmer was there working with him. And he just kind of prayed a prayer before the Lord. He said, Lord, you know, he said, you're calling me in the ministry. And Moses, in the, in Moses was called in the ministry through you. And this was signified by a burning bush. He said, God, you gave him a burning bush that kind of witnessed his ministry. He said, you're not a respecter of persons. What you'll do for one, you'll do for another. He said, would you do something like that for me? He said, all of a sudden, this 18-year-old smells smoke behind him, turns around, and there's a corn stalk that's on fire, but it won't go out. It's just burning. True story. Just burning, 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 and it won't go out. He said pretty soon after he'd stare at it for about five minutes and it wasn't going out, he looked over and the old farmer was staring at it too. And the old farmer went from staring at it to staring at him and looked at him and said, Son, whatever God's calling you to do, you better do it. <laughs> the old farmer understood. God was speaking through the corn stalk. Let me ask you a question. What is God speaking to you through? Telling you about his call on your life. Whatever it is, if you're going to get to it, you've got to press into it. You've got to press into it. You've got to press into it. How many here want to go into the supernatural realm? You've got to press in. You've got to press in. You've got to press in. Can I hear an amen? You've got to pray in faith and press in and believe that God's going to do it. Well, you know what your problem is? You don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, you'd have angelic. Whoa, 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 whoa. My Bible says the Lord's the author and the finisher of my faith. Which means he began the right words of faith on the first page of the book of my life. And he'll write the end when it's done. Amen? So I'm going to press in in faith believing. And believing that if I don't have enough faith, then he's going to give me more faith so I can see this happen. By the way, be careful praying the prayer, God, give me more faith. It's like praying for patience. God's going to take you through things that will give you faith. Big things. Things where you begin not to be moved, but you learn to stand still and move things. That kind of faith. Can I hear an amen? But what do we have to do? We have to press in. 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 And I really believe that one of the things, amazingly enough, that God's calling the church to right now is to return back to simplicity. Remember he spoke to one of the, book, one of the churches in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. You know, I have this against you. You've forsaken your first love. Now go back and do the things you once did. What did I once do? Well, God... I was so on fire for you, man. I pressed in all the time. If I had a spare moment, I was in your word. If I had a spare moment, I had the praise and worship on. If I had a spare moment, God, I was pursuing you. Return to your first love. Can I hear an amen? Return to your first love. Return to your first love. Return to your first love. This is what God is calling us to. Identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Pressing into the things that he's called us to. This is the heart of God for this generation. And to begin to realize there's a whole lot going on around us that's generational, that is supernatural, that is of a whole nother realm that we've never walked in before that we need to start pressing into quick so it can begin to be affected. What are you talking about, Pastor? <laughs> I really believe it's time for the church to start walking in healing, in anointing for healing. To walk in a deeper prophetic anointing. To walk in a place of signs, wonders, and miracles. Because the church has been so delayed in getting into the supernatural realm, pressing into that next realm, that that realm presses in on us all the time, and we don't realize it. And I'm not talking about God's side of the realm. See, I'm convinced as believers, you're either going to press into the supernatural realm, or it's going to press against you. And we as God's people have got to start pressing in. And there's so much supernatural that's going on all around us. And God wants us to be able to walk in the supernatural realm. 
and people are going to see that and things are going to happen. I, I read this week about a, a, a pastor who flowed in healing anointing and he was at a healing conference and this lady comes up to be ministered to 77 years old and she comes up like this to be ministered to. Now how many of us would go, well she's 77 years old. I mean really, how much time does she have left? Okay. We'll have a little bit of prayer, a little bit of faith, and then she can go on to, Cindy's at least going, what? But isn't that the mentality of a lot of people? She's lived most of her life. How many Christians would see her and go, she's being oppressed by the demonic realm. She can be healed and have quality of life for the rest of her life. Amen? I think the, the church's unbelief is, in, is really what we use when we really think, oh, she's 77, let's pray for her. And, Hopefully, you know, no, 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 no. God wants us to begin to walk in a place of radical faith, okay? So this pastor's beginning to minister to the 77-year-old lady, beautiful grandmother type, and the Lord starts flowing in the prophetic. We cannot underestimate what God wants to do in the prophetic in the end times. God wants the prophetic to become a normal part of your life where you can't shut it out, turn it on or shut it off. The prophetic just flows no matter where you are. Or you can have insightful God conversations with people no matter where you are. He wants it to be a lifestyle. So this lady comes up. She's got rheumatoid arthritis in the back. She's hunched. She's got all this stuff. And, and he goes to pray for her and the Lord says, ask her what happened when she was 17. She's now 77, 60 years ago. Honey, what happened when you were 17? And she says, oh, I don't remember anything. So the pastor prays, Lord, give her remembrance. And she goes, oh, she said, when I was 17, a, a, a drunk driver went head on with my older brother's car and killed him. And the Holy Spirit says, Mo, there's more. And she said, oh, yeah, when I was 17, my younger brother was misdiagnosed. He had pneumonia and was misdiagnosed and he died when I was 17 and she said so when I entered my 17th year I was a sister with two brothers by the end of my 17th year I wasn't even a sister anymore <laughs> and at an earlier age her back started hunching so he says to her he says and the Holy Spirit's telling him to do this have you ever forgiven that drunk driver and she said oh honey she said he was just drunk it wasn't his fault that wasn't what I asked. Did you ever forgive that drunk driver? No. Okay. Did you ever forgive the doctor that misdiagnosed your little brother? Oh, they didn't know as much back then. It wasn't his fault. That wasn't what I asked. Did you forgive the doctor? Well, no, I guess I didn't. You know what that is? That's the supernatural realm encroaching on her life and her health, and her happiness. See, if we don't press in on it, it's going to press in on us. We've got to understand that. So he leads her through a simple prayer. He said, I mean, he said the clouds didn't part. He said the angels didn't fill the room. He said there wasn't a supernatural release that about blew me, you know, off my feet. He said, I just led her through a prayer of forgiveness for those folks. And he said, after we got done in Jesus' name, amen, he said, I looked at her and she looked at me and all of a sudden something popped and she went bum, 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 and stood straight up. That was the power of God and no hype. We have that kind of access to the supernatural realm. That is there and it's ours. But we've got to cross over. What's over on the east side of the Jordan River, your flesh? what you want, your dreams, your schedule, your plans. You know what God says? Go through the river of descent. Go through the river of dying and come back on the other side and I'm going to take you into the promised land of everything that I have for you. The callings, the anointings, the visitations, all of this. But you have to go through the river. You have to go through the river. You have to go through the river. Well, God, I don't know if I can go through the river. 
Follow my presence. Because you won't be in the river alone. Remember the three Hebrew boys? Who'd they meet in the furnace? One who looked like the Son of God. See, he doesn't take you anywhere without going there with you. Jesus, we're going to drown! Why are you sleeping? I'm here with you, fellas. What's going to happen? I'm here. What can happen to you? Is anybody catching this? See, God's calling you to the Jordan River. Even Jesus had to go to the Jordan River. Think about that. Even Jesus had to go to the Jordan River. So what is God wanting to do in your life in 2019? I can't believe I'm saying that. You know what he wants you to do at the, the end of this year as this year is eroding away? He wants you to go to the Jordan. What does he want you to do in 2019? Come up out of the Jordan to be everything that he, he has created you to be. Some of you are going to come out of the Jordan as prophets. Some are going to come out as apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Some of you are going to come out as forerunners. One of the most crucial callings to follow God wherever he leads and to go through that Jordan River so God can prepare you is the calling of the forerunner. Is the calling of the forerunner. Because you're going to blaze the trail for so many others to follow. You don't need to raise a hand, but is anybody in this room called to be a forerunner? I know there's at least one. There's many more than one even in this room. Where are you being called to be a forerunner in? That medical visitation ministry? Time to be a forerunner. It's time to be a forerunner in whatever he's called you to at the school your place of work in the church in the community it's time for us to be the forerunners he's called us to but he's saying first of all do you want to be a forerunner are you willing to accept the call yes lord i don't know exactly what i'm accepting but i know it's you so i'm willing okay then follow my presence okay god i'm following your presence whoa wait whoa 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 you're heading towards the river of death god Whoa, and this flood season. Whoa, just follow my presence. Just follow my presence. Just, God, whoa, look, wait. Follow my presence. Just follow my presence. Just follow my presence. Just follow my presence. Just follow my presence. Behold, I'm with you even into the end of the world. Just follow my presence. And God's presence will take you through the river of death will take you into the promised land, but guess what the promised land is filled with? The Hivites and the Jebusites and all these people. Keep following me. He follows you. He takes you into the battlefield. Keep following me. He takes you onto the holy ground. Keep following me. He takes you into the tent of meeting until every bit of his presence is gone. Keep following me. God takes you through rebellion in the camp. Keep following me. God is preparing, God is building, God is working, God is doing it. But you have to be willing to go the river. I thought you called this something really nice, crossing over into your calling. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a great title, but what's the meat of it? You've got to go through the Jordan to get there. You have to go through the Jordan to get there. The river of descent, that's what's going to get you there. So what's God calling you to in the remainder of this year? Dying! That's encouraging. What's God called you to the remainder of this year? Brokenness! That's great. What's God called you to the remainder of the year? Pressing in like never before. You'll go through the river and you come out the other side. Brick in one hand and sword in the other to fight and to build, to build in the fight. That's how you'll come out of the river. God says it's time. God says it's time. God says I initiate, you respond. But he says in some of these things, I want you to initiate and I'll respond. So who in this room, and don't raise a hand, has that little voice inside of them that tells them, 
you know, God will do these things for everybody else but. Like God created some to be superstars and others to be duds. That's a lie of Satan. It's an absolute lie. Why does God do it through so-and-so? Because he pressed him. Because he went through a lot of difficult things. Because he was willing to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's why. Remember the old prophet praying over the guy in the airport? Wanted his anointing. Lord, I ask you to break him. Lord, I ask you to kill him. Lord, I ask you to take him through difficult places. Wait, that's not what I asked for. That's how you get it. That's how you get it. How many are willing? How many are willing? How many are willing? I want to encourage you sometime today to get alone with God. And when you get alone with him, I want you to think about the prophetic word that God delivered at the beginning of the message today through Pastor Brent all the way to the closing of this message and ask the Holy Spirit what very specifically he wants you to lay hold of that was spoken because God spoke a lot today. He spoke a lot today. God, what, what do you want me to lay hold of with this? You spoke so much today, God. And God's going to begin to give you themes and bits and pieces to really lay hold of. He's going to talk to you about pressing in, about going through the Jordan. He's going to talk to you about having the heart that you stay in the tent of meeting until every bit of the presence is gone. He's going to begin to talk to you about some of the voices that you listen to that you shouldn't. Because the voice that says, oh, God does that for everybody, but I'm not even going to finish it. That's not God. You know what that is? That's the supernatural realm pressing in on you in the form of a demonic lie. Well, God only uses this type or that type or God prefers this person over that baloney. God prefers the one that will oppress him. Lord, well, who do you esteem? The one that's humble and contrite and trembles at my word. Presses in, who loves me. Who isn't satisfied with the church of their generation, but they want so much more. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes today in a non-religious way. Hallelujah. There's so much in this message that is for everybody here today and for those that are going to listen via YouTube. There's so much meat that God laid out, and that is so not the message I thought that was going to be delivered today. So praise God. We, we listened, amen? We listened. I, again, I want to encourage you this week, go through your notes, listen to the Holy Spirit. Dane will have the message up for you this week on YouTube. Listen to it again. Glean some more. Because there's so much in this message that God wants you to lay hold of because it's time for you to cross over. Now this is what we're going to do. We're just going to take a couple minutes. I don't believe we need a, a long, drawn-out altar call today. But the Lord is in this room. We said at the beginning of the message there, beginning of our time together today, Lord, we're here because you're here. And the Lord is saying, okay, I'm here. Now are you going to surrender to my agenda? Are you going to listen to what I'm saying? Are you going to do what I tell you to do? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? So I want to encourage anybody in this room that's wrestling with God on something. Maybe you're wrestling with God on going through the river. Maybe you're wrestling with God on the brokenness it's going to take to get to that place. Maybe you're wrestling God with liking your time, your free time. Maybe you're wrestling God with things that he hasn't even shared with me. But the end result is it hinders you from really walking in the fullness what he's, of what he's called you to. Church, there's nothing that you can hold on to that's worth it. 
There's nothing you can hold on to that's worth it. And church, when we stand before the Lord, no excuse is going to be relevant when we stand before him who is absolute truth. No excuse will be relevant or acceptable. But God, I was going to next year. God, I was going to next month. Well, God, you know, surely when I got a little older, then I was going to really go after. No, there's going to be no excuse. So what is it that God's called you to that you aren't listening in, aren't surrendering in, aren't giving in to him in? What is it? You know, as we go into the new year, the new year is a perfect time to really think about what we would love to see God do in our life where we'd love to see God take us. It's a perfect time to really get with God and say, God, what are your dreams for my life this year coming up? Lord, what do you want to do? And God, what's it going to take to get there? And just let God speak. You know, one of the things I've watched the enemy do this year is try to get people to get tired out and give up. I've watched him try to do it again and again and again and again. Tire people out, get them to give up. And I've seen some do it. I've seen others stand strong in the midst. Stand strong in the midst. What does Ephesians 6 say? Stand in his mighty power, having all done all to stand. Stand in his mighty power. Stand in his mighty power. Stand in his mighty power. Now is not the time to give up, pack up, or shut up. Now is the time to press in and let go. So I'm going to be silent for a couple of moments here. And if there's anything that you need to surrender to God, give to God. Let go of. If there's any revelation that you need him to lead you into for what is maybe seemingly put your life in neutral to where you don't feel like you're going anywhere, Now's the time to really ask the Holy Spirit. Now's the time to really listen to him because he wants to speak to you and he wants to make this upcoming year the best year of your life yet, even with the warfare and the difficult things because through it all, you're going to gain more of Jesus than you've ever had before. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for these times of surrender. Lord, for these times when the things that we've been struggling with and we don't know what to do with, God, where you expose these things, you deal with these things. God, you move our heart from one place to another. God, I pray that you'll do that for everyone in this room and for everyone that's going to listen via YouTube. God, I ask that you would use this word to get into their hearts, Lord God, to get at the hidden places, and Lord, to bring them to a place of deeper surrender and pressing in so, Lord, they can walk in the fullness of your calling on their life. Lord, you said to Laodicea, I'd rather have you be hot or cold. But if you want to be lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Lord, we never want you to spew us out of your mouth. Lord, we want to be on fire for you. So Lord Jesus, I ask that you would impart a fresh passion for you upon every person in this room listening. Lord, a fresh passion for you on everyone that's going to listen through Ustream or YouTube, Lord. 
Lord, I pray, God, that you'll use this word and you'll use this time to begin to move a generation forward, following the ark of your presence, Lord, into the Jordan River, Lord, the river of descent and dying, and Lord, coming out different than what they were when they went in. Lord Jesus, we're willing to do what it is that you want us to do. Lord, just be with us every step of the way. Lord, I plead your blood today over the forerunners that are in this room and that are listening uh, via YouTube. Lord, I ask God that you would be with them, that you would help them in the midst of this lonely time because, Lord, we understand being a forerunner can be very, very lonely. God, be with our forerunners, strengthen them, and give them wisdom, Lord, to know what areas that it is that you want them to forerun in for you. God, anoint them, equip them, empower them. Lord, I ask that you'd begin to give them angelic encounters, heavenly visitations. Lord, I ask that the, the blessings of Joel chapter 2 would pour out upon them and upon everyone in this house, Lord. Lord, may our old men dream dreams, our young men have visions. Lord, may mighty things begin to happen. Lord, we thank you today for this message. We thank you today, Lord, that even though it wasn't very comfortable, it was a message that we needed as we come into this new year. Lord, we dedicate 2019 to you and the remainder of 2018. Lord, may the latter glory be so much greater than the former glory. And Lord Jesus, we ask now for traveling mercies for everyone as they head back home. Lord, keep them safe. And Lord, may your word not return void. And Lord Jesus, we ask this now in your precious name. For you're the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by you. Lord, there's no other name under heaven given to men by which they can be saved but your name. Lord, you've been given a name that's above every name. That at your name, every knee is going to bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's in your name that we pray, Lord Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we had a little different word today, didn't we? But it was a word that we needed. Sometimes words are not necessarily pleasant, but they're words that cause us to grow. And I pray that this is one of those very words that will cause you to grow because I know since God gave it to me, it's done nothing but push me and tug on me and deal with my heart since God gave me this word. It was just one of those. So I pray it does the same thing for you. And I want to encourage everybody to be safe traveling home today um, regardless of uh, how much snow we have or don't have. Um, I'm hearing a little bit of of uh, precipitation on tires out there as vehicles go by. So I want to encourage you to be safe. I want to remind everybody again, we have